This Fidelity fund manager has beaten the stock market for 34 years. In fact, he's even beaten Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway shares. I'm about to show you what he's buying and what you can learn. Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue here. Thank you for joining us for a very special video. I love these kinds of videos, what you can learn from the best investors in the stock market and how you can become a better investor. Don't forget to join the community by tapping that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode and check out tomorrow's video, the seven highest yielding dividend stocks with no dividend cuts. First though, learning how to analyze stocks is so important. I do want you to be a better investor. That's why I created this quick five minute guide to analyze any stocks. In less time than it takes to smash that like button, you'll learn how to pick the best stocks. It's totally free, just something I like to do for all you out there in the community. So look for the link in the description below. Back to our main topic though, and we know that most active fund managers just do not beat their index or the stock market return. A report out recently found that nearly 80%, eight in 10 fund managers fell behind their market average. And this research by DCA funds shows it by type of fund. As many as nine in 10 managers in international and emerging market funds failed to beat their comparison index. Which of course begs the question, why in the hell would you invest in an ETF or a mutual fund? Why not just do it yourself and save that fee that you would pay to the manager? Because there are some fund managers that have proven they can beat the market. And whether you invest on your own or in their funds, when you find one, it's important to learn from what they're doing. Joe Tillinghast, manager of the Fidelity Low Price Stock Fund since its launch in 1989, has produced an annualized return of 13%. That's more than 63 times your money over 34 years. And it blows the doors off the S&P 500 return at 10% a year. In fact, this Fidelity fund even beat Warren Buffett. Here we see the percentage returns on shares of Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, a 5,400% return over the 34 years for a 12.5% annualized return. So I wanted to dig into the fund's best and worst stock picks, what you can learn from it, and how you can use in this investing strategy in your own portfolio. Here we can see on the Fidelity Fund page, first in the style box in the middle, that it's a mid-cap value fund. That means it targets companies in that mid-cap range from $2 billion to $10 billion market valuation. So we're not talking about giants like Apple and Tesla here. Also not those penny stocks either though. That gives the fund some growth, but it's also investing in those value stocks. So stocks with that below average, below market average price to earnings ratio. So it's going to start with that universe of medium sized companies, those companies between two and $10 billion market cap. Then it's going to find the average PE ratio for stocks in each industry group. And then those with the below average PE ratio are its targets for further research. So again, that mid cap focus is going to give it some growth companies ready to grow into that large cap group. But then it's also investing in companies selling at a PE ratio discount. So a discount to the price to earnings ratio average of their industry. It also says it targets companies with a share prices under $35 per share. So that low price target as well. On the far right here in asset allocation, you can see that it's all stocks, but it invests in US and international stocks. It's got a third of the fund in foreign stocks, and you can see the breakdown here in the bottom two tables. About 12% of the fund is in European stocks, another 9% in Japan, and 8% in emerging market stocks. And you see some individual country weights in the middle. Now that's going to help it a little bit with that value focus because international stocks tend to have lower price to earnings ratios compared to U.S. companies. And within the sectors, this top left table shows how much each stock sector is in the fund compared to the Russell 2000 index. So which sectors it's targeting. And we see that the fund is overweight in technology, consumer discretionary, energy, consumer staples, and stocks in the materials sector. I'm not sure there's a lot you can take away from this though, because the fund isn't taking a top down approach. It's not saying, I think this sector is going to do better. So let's buy more of the stocks in this sector. So in contrast to that top down stock picking strategy, where the manager would look at big macroeconomic themes of the stock sectors that could do well, and then look into the stocks within those target sectors. This is a bottom up stock picking fund, investing in those stocks that meet that low price, the low PE criteria that might do well. And finally, here at the bottom left, you see the top current holdings, stocks like AutoZone, United Health, Elevance, and surprisingly Wells Fargo, which breaks that mid cap criteria. But most of these are within that mid cap range of two to $10 billion stocks. Now that Fidelity low price fund is a mutual fund and charges 0.82% expense ratio, which is very high compared to, especially compared to exchange traded funds or ETFs and only pays a 1% dividend yield. 
Of that said, the return on the Fidelity Fund has been more than worth it over the years, and, and you can invest directly, but I'm more interested in learning how Tillinghast has managed to beat the market for so many years. Here we are on the article, and we're going to get to the best and worst stocks he picks and what we can learn from them. But I think the best thing you can learn from this article is if you scroll down and read this comment here, the fun thing about investing is you're constantly learning, sometimes by losing money, sometimes by making money when you didn't expect to. And it's the ones where you lose money tend to stick with you. Nation, that is so true and something every investor needs to learn from. I know it can be painful when you lose money on a stock, but it, you cannot let it torment you, okay? You cannot lose sleep over your decisions in the past. What could have been, what might have been. You need to learn from it though and move on, but always be learning from your mistakes. Here we are on his first winner, this Ansys, and he bought this in 2001 when he was trading for just $3 a share and currently now at about $319 a share. That is 106 times his money, a 23% annual return. And he's talking about here trying to find tech stocks that aren't prone to destruction. So companies with a defensible advantage in their IP, something that makes them, gives them the competitive advantage in that IP, in that R&D and what they can do, and that is defensible against competitors or, or just people that want to repeat that. Now, part of this was great timing as well, just after the dot-com bust when, when tech was absolutely destroyed. The NASDAQ itself has produced a 711% return since then. And if we're looking at potential stocks in this theme, I would look at SoFi Technologies. It's a company we've been talking about a lot on the channel over the last year. It is well up, even, even after the recent sell-off, it is up from about 4 or $5 a share just last year. Winning really fintech because it has that banking charter for the low cost deposit funding. So what a lot of investors don't understand. A lot of fintech companies do not have an actual banking license, a banking charter. So they can't collect deposits from customers. That means they have to get their funding from, from loans and from equity positions, which is very much more expensive. The SoFi, for its part, SoFi has that banking license. It can collect deposits just like a normal bank and then pay out basically next to nothing. It is paying out about 4.5% on, uh, on deposits right now as those rates start going up. But that is very much cheaper than other deposit or other funding for a lot of these other fintech companies. So that, that banking license, that banking charter gives it a defensible advantage against a lot of the other fintech stocks. Another defensible advantage in tech stocks here, I believe Tesla winning in cars, not just because of that breakthrough EV technology, but also because something nobody is talking about, wages. Okay, first, Tesla production is not union, so it pays less in wages and benefits versus something like a GM or a Ford. They are now shut down because the unions want a 40%, 46% wage increase, but also because EV cars have fewer parts than a traditional combustion engine. Okay, that means fewer parts to produce, fewer to install and manufacturing, which means fewer people needed to build each car, fewer workers. In fact, I recently broke down the $2,000 price target for Tesla. Mine is not quite that $2,000 price target, but even on the low case scenario, it's going to make you want to own the share. So I'm going to link to that in the description below. Check that video out. Telling us other winner here, Monster Beverage. He bought this again also in 2001 when it was Hanson's Natural for about four cents a share when it's adjusted for splits. Now it's at $57 each, a ginormous 1,400 times his return. Here he says he likes companies that try lots of experiments. You know, they may not always work, but they are innovative and that companies tend to find those defensible advantages. I think a great example of this is the Google parent Alphabet, ticker GOOG here. Most investors don't realize it, but besides Google's lock on search and that strong business in cloud, it is constant, constantly developing new ideas like its Waymo self-driving unit and Google Ventures and everything from AI to life sciences. All those hits or all those things that they're trying, those experiments, they might not, might not all be successful, but they are going to find those that they have a defensible advantage in, that IP, and it's going to take this stock higher. His big loser here was Health South, uh, bought in 2002, and he's lost over 99% of his investment. He says here it was because he was paying attention to the adjusted earnings and not free cash flow. And Nation, this is the first thing you learn as an analyst, and I'm surprised he would make one of these mistakes, but it just shows you how easy it is to make sometimes. Folks, if we go here to the financials in Yahoo Finance, and you can find this on any investing platform, but we'll go here to the income statement. And you usually, if you hear everybody talking about earnings per share, profits, net income, that's that bottom of the income statement that shows you the profitability or the profits, how much the company made in those earnings per share. But folks, that income statement and that earnings company's report are filled with manipulation. You know, everything from reporting sales early, so they extend lots of credit out to their, out to their customers, 
credit so much that they doubt that they can even get paid back on a lot of these sales, but just reporting that sales growth helps boost the stock price to under reporting expenses. You know, we, we all remember, well, maybe we all don't remember the AOL case back in the nineties when it was sending out all those CDs and it was capitalizing those, you know, rather than, rather than report all those expenses that would have lowered its earnings through those years, it was capitalizing those as an asset on the balance sheet way, way over reporting or under reporting the expenses and hence under reporting their, their actual or over reporting their actual earnings. Management can make earnings per share look a hell of a lot better with all these tricks than, than they actually are. So what is much harder to fudge here is actual cash flow. And that's what you see here on this cash flow statement, the statement of cash flows, the actual cash in and out of the company. So you always want to follow this first on any company that you're analyzing, especially this operating cash flow. That is the earnings power of the actual of the business itself. Then you look for this free cash flow down here. Okay. So the operating cash flow is the cash generated, the actual cash coming in for the business, not manipulated by accounting tricks cash coming in from the business, the operating cash flow. From that, if you take the operating cash flow minus capital expenditures, which is within this investing cash flow number, but you take the operating cash flow minus that capital expenditures, which is this the bare, bare minimum amount of money that company needs to reinvest in its business just to keep it going at the same pace. That that the rest of that is the free cash flow. Okay. Free cash flow is the money that theoretically the cash that the company could return to shareholders uh, and still have the company keep on growing. I know it's a lot deeper into the financial statements and a lot more work than a lot of investors want to do, but nation, you cannot depend on some YouTuber just to pick your stocks for you. Okay. You need to learn how to analyze stocks for yourself and be a better investor. Look for that link below and get your free five minute guide to analyze any stock. I'll show you the most important measures to make sure you're always picking the best stocks. Or click on the video to the right for the five monthly dividend stocks with the fastest dividend growth. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.